So welcome everybody to tonight's talk, um, which is going to be all about ladybirds and it's given by Helen Roy. And we're really delighted that she's agreed to speak to us. She's a renowned ecologist, entomologist and academic specializing in ladybirds and in non-native species. She currently works at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. And she's somebody who's just received numerous awards during her career, including a ZSL silver medal and an MBE as well as a British Ecology Thanks, Society yeah. Award for Eco Ecological Engagement. She's co-authored various works on ladybirds and their natural history, and she's also been a past president of the Royal Entomological Society. We're really delighted that she's agreed to join us this evening to talk about ladybirds. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and hand you over to Helen. Thank you very much. And it's, it's wonderful to be with you all. I will just um, start sharing my screen. And um, can you see that? Okay, is the slide there for you? Yes, that's working perfectly. Perfect. It's wonderful to be with you all. And um, just to thank um, everyone for their patience in um, tolerating my chaotic diary and rearranging from last week to this week. I'm really sorry about that clash. I was um, flying into Nairobi and I couldn't be sure that I would be on a connection, but I'm delighted to be with you all this evening and delighted to be talking about ladybirds. And I've put Peter Brown here on my title slide because Peter and I have the great pleasure of um, leading as volunteers the UK Ladybird Survey which is such a huge pleasure and a privilege and also I've then added many many others because the records that people contribute through the UK Ladybird Survey just well they enrich um, mine and Peter's lives but they also add enormously to our research and to the understanding of um, ladybirds not just in the UK um, beyond as well and I'll get to that as I go through um, this talk. So I just to mention that I'm based within the Biological Records Centre and I often think if someone had described um, the work that I do now and have been doing for, for a few decades um, to me when I was a, a, a much younger person, I would have thought what an absolutely perfect and ideal position to have. I get to work with lots of the recording schemes um, across the UK and, and as you'll all be aware, we have this unique and amazing um, activity around biological recording across the UK and this spiral just really shows not really a spiral is it but this circle shows you the huge range of recording schemes and societies that are active within um, and across the UK and that um, many of which are hosted within the Biological Record Centre. And I also just put mention there of um, some uh, one of our latest atlases, although actually now the centipede um, atlas is now out and that will be our, our latest atlas. But you can see all the list of atlases within the Biological Record Centre um, website. And as again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with biological recording and it's about going out and recording what you see, where you see it, when you see it and, and who you are. And in many ways, biological recording, of course, is the same as it's always been, giving many, many of us enormous amounts of pleasure. Um, but of course, now we have new technologies that we can use, such as smartphone apps. And this gives me an opportunity to mention the iRecord app. Maybe many of you are already using that, but it's a really fantastic um, recording app. Um, to enter your records for any species. So when you're out on your forays at the weekend, which sound really exciting, um, you could be recording through the iRecord app if you're not already doing so. So I'd just like to include this animation, and this is from one of my wonderful colleagues, um, Tom August, and this is looking through a year in biological recording, and this is just data coming into iRecord. You can see the enormous number of records that we receive every year across a whole variety of different taxonomic groups. And I think what's really impressive as well is that you see from the, the map there that there's amazing spatial coverage. There are, of course, gaps, but on the whole, it's really fantastic. And that gives us um, an incredible incredible overview of wildlife across the UK and allows us to do all kinds of exciting um, research and reporting for policy purposes as well. And you might be looking at that graph which shows the sort of records coming in over time and if like me you're fascinated by insects you'll be excited to see the blue line for invertebrates kind of winning the race. Um, but it is important to remember that um, this is just data coming into iRecord and for example um, the bird and mammal data goes into the um, British Trust for Ornithology sites on the whole although it is possible to record through these other through iRecord and they all do link up and join behind the scene. But for sure you know 
bird recording and plant recording is, is incredibly um, active as well. So I've had a passion for citizen science um, for, for a long, long time. And um, I've had the opportunity to work on citizen science and to be thinking about um, different approaches to citizen science and particularly how biological recording fits in with the general scheme of other kinds of citizen science and the ways in which people are involved from the design stage of a project all the way through to producing outputs. And I think what's really unique about biological recording is that often actually the volunteer participants know more than the professionals who are kind of collating the data in terms of certainly on the taxonomic aspects. And so, you know, I have huge gratitude and appreciation for all the volunteers who are producing data and contributing it um, through the various biological recording schemes and societies. And before I get to the ladybirds, I just thought I'd mention um, a few of the other initiatives that are going on. So while a lot of the biological recording activity is around these sort of occurrence records of where things are seen, there are some more structured and systematic surveys that people can get involved with, both through the National Plant Monitoring Scheme, for example, or maybe some of you are already involved with the UK Butterfly Monitoring Scheme and have been walking transects for a long time. But one of our newest schemes um, hosted by the Biological Record Centre is the UK Pollinator Monitoring Scheme and led by um, my colleague Claire Cromwell. And um, she um, has been setting up a variety of different schemes in partnership um, with um, other organizations. And there's something for everyone, I think, in the pollinator monitoring scheme, because people can get involved just in short 10 minute counts, these flower insect time counts, or they could perhaps adopt a one kilometer square and do something bigger. So this is just to highlight there are one kilometer squares available. Obviously, things are slowing down now for the pollinators as we approach winter, but maybe you'd like to peruse this website and think whether this might be something for you from next April onwards, and um, you'd be really welcome to get involved. And everyone can get involved with the flower insect time counts. And what I've really enjoyed as well is seeing how this approach where people sit there for 10 minutes and just watch what flowers visit in insects in a, in a set kind of quadrat area. And we've been able to then share this method with other places around the world, for example, in Cyprus, where they're now using the pollinator um, survey and calling it um, Pomsky um, and getting lots of people involved there in pollinator monitoring. So that was just a few quick adverts around some of the broader activities of the Biological Record Center, but um, now on to ladybirds. And I've used this slide a lot and it comes from a volunteer from a long time ago, but I just really love that in that little tiny hole in that concrete pillar in that very urban setting is that huge diversity of ladybirds, a seven spot in there, little 10 spot, an orange ladybird. And outside as well, you can see a harlequin ladybird um, as well. And it just kind of, to me, sort of emphasizes this sort of just the joy of biological recording and the discoveries of ladybirds in all kinds of um, different places. For sure, you'll see a lot in the cemetery when you're out on Saturday, because at this time of year, when the ladybirds are heading to their overwintering sites, cemeteries are a fantastic place for ladybirds. So I've already mentioned that with Pete Brown, I co-lead um, the Ladybird Survey, and um, actually we were one of the, well, I think we were the first survey in the UK to go online, and it followed the arrival of the Harlequin Ladybird in 2004, and at the time I was on sabbatical at Cambridge University working with um, the wonderful Mike Majerus, who sadly died um, since, and he was leading the Coxnellody recording scheme at that time. And we saw an opportunity with the arrival of the Harlequin ladybird. There was nothing that could be done about the Harlequin ladybird. And it was very concerning that it was arriving. It's a, a ladybird native to Asia, introduced into lots of countries as a biological control agent of pest insects, but never intentionally introduced into the UK, but found its way here. And we were very concerned because it's a voracious predator. It's a very generalist predator. It eats not just the pest insects, but other ladybirds and lacewings and hoverfly larvae and butterfly um, larvae, all kinds of insects. But we knew there was nothing that could be done. But we saw an opportunity to get people recording harlequin ladybirds and other ladybirds to um, reinvigorate ladybird recording, but also to track the spread of this non-native um, species. And so Pete and I have been leading the survey. At first, we were leading it with Mike. And then sadly, after he died, the two of us continued um, for um, several decades now. And it, and it continues to be just as enjoyable as it always has. But one of the things we did when the Harlequin Ladybird arrived was create a website and get some online recording underway. 
both Pete and I enjoy writing and promoting ladybirds. And um, this is an article from um, the um, BBC Wildlife magazine. We take every opportunity if we are asked to do an interview or um, on the radio or to write something um, for the media, then we're really delighted to do so. Not only do we enjoy doing that, um, but also it promotes the survey and helps to keep um, people reminded of um, the value of their recording. So I thought I'd begin this talk by going through some kind of um, recording and identification techniques for ladybirds and then move to just talk about some of the research that we've been doing with all of these um, amazing records that people submit. So and some of this I'm sure some of you will be familiar with, but maybe it will be a reminder um, for others. But ladybirds are beetles. They have these hard wing cases and those wing cases are often brightly colored, but not always. They're small to medium sized beetles, so they can be really tiny, but the biggest being about 10 millimeters long. I mean, actually worldwide, there's about 6,000 species of ladybirds. There's about 47 in um, the UK. And I say about because we keep getting new arrivals. Um, for a whole variety of different reasons, and we can we can discuss that later. They're usually round or oval, um, and then they have really short and clubbed um, antennae. This pronotum, this structure behind the head, and I don't know why I always imagine that I'm a ladybird when I'm demonstrating this, but anyway, I, I do. Um, this is a really important structure to, to take a look at for identification purposes. Actually, it's even more of a reliable identification part of the ladybird than are, are the wing cases. They have short legs that they often retract under their body. And if you were to take a really close look at their feet, you would see that they have four segments, but you'd only easily see three that are visible. But these are the things that make a ladybird um, a ladybird. Ladybirds um, go through complete metamorphosis like other beetles. So they have an egg, then they have a larval stage and they have four different instars for the larvae. So a little first instar hatches from the egg, it sheds its skin, becomes a second instar, sheds its skin to a third, sheds its skin to a fourth. Then it goes into the pupal stage and then out emerges um, the adult. And so this is the life cycle of the seven spot um, ladybird. And this is the, the kind of life cycle through the year. So now at the moment, seven spot ladybirds, like all of the other ladybirds are in, in the UK are in the adult stage and they're heading into their overwintering sites and they all have slightly different preferred places to go. The seven spot ladybird will be starting to go under leaf litter. And that's why it's really great if you can leave some leaf litter in your gardens or if people will leave it out in parks and things because the, lady, the seven spot ladybird will go underneath that leaf litter to, to spend the winter months as an adult and then we're going to have to wait all the way till spring until we we get to see these seven spot ladybirds on the whole um, and then they will emerge from the overwintering they'll begin to feed and then their priority will be to mate and lay their eggs and as soon as they've done that that generation dies off and then the new generation comes through so we sort of have this phase through june of only seeing larvae and then we have these new adults. Now this is the life cycle of the seven spot ladybird. It can only get one generation in through the year. It needs to have winter in order to become sexually mature. Other ladybirds are not like that. The two spot ladybird, for instance, is a continuous breeder can just, and gets a couple of generations in per year. And similarly so is the harlequin ladybird. So here is um, the seven spot ladybird and um, the, Seven spots are quite kind of conserved in how they look. So they have these seven spots with one just being behind this pronotum. The pronotum always looks like this with these sort of white patches on either side. And um, it's quite a reasonably um, large ladybird, but it's really, I think, the iconic ladybird. I did a lot of work on seven spot ladybirds um, through my PhD, and they remain a very common and widespread um, species. This is the two spot ladybird and unlike the seven spot ladybird, it's quite highly color pattern um, variable. So the typical form, as we would call it, is the red with the two black spots. And then again, notice on this pronotum, it has these white flanking markings and a sort of black M shape almost on this typical form. But it can also have this um, melanic form as well. And you can see there that in this case, it has these red spots. What's really important to look at 
is that those red spots at the front go all the way down to the edge of the wing cases and it has um, black legs because there are other species that can look quite like it. And this is a species that I'm going to come back to later on when I talk about some of the research, because it's a species that was common and widespread in my childhood. And as a consequence of the arrival of the Harlequin ladybird, it really has gone quite a substantial decline. This is the 10 spot ladybird, close relative of the two spot ladybird, very, very similar size, could look very harlequin like, but the typical form, which is in the big picture here, it only has one spot on either shoulder, whereas the harlequin will have two spots and the harlequin is much, much bigger. These um, 10 spot ladybirds have brown legs, the two spot had um, black legs, but look at all these different forms. And I love this one in the back, the bottom corner, the bimaculata form with this kind of stripe, this flash of red. It looks so, so different to the typical form. It's really fascinating. And there above is the, the checkered form as well. So here we have the harlequin, as you can see, the um, non-melanic color form, the orange color form in the, in the far corner there can look quite 10 spot like, but it also has four rows of spots and the 10 spot had three rows of spots, um, but it's much, much bigger. You'll see so many of these when you're in the, um, the churchyard at the weekend, um, they're in high numbers at the moment and Harlequin ladybirds love churchyards, but they're also very polymorphic, color pattern variable. And so you can see the, the male ladybird here mating with the female ladybird and he's um, black with these four red splodges. These also have brown legs and they have these white flanking markings again on the pronotum. But here's a comparison, the size difference between the 10 spot and the harlequin ladybird and the rows of spots. But often, often the pronotum of the 10 spot is quite speckled, as you can see there, where it's a bit more fused um, for the harlequin, but I mean, superficially they do look very, very similar. This is the uh, 22 spot ladybird. I always like to tell everyone this is Pete Brown's favorite uh, ladybird and um, it's a very, very spotty yellow ladybird. Um, it very much enjoys feeding on mildew. That's what it does. So it's a little bit different from all those others that I've just shown you, which are aphid, um, mainly feed on aphids. Although, as I mentioned, all of them will feed on other things and the harlequin ladybird particularly doesn't seem to really mind what it feeds on. This is the 14 spot ladybird. So we're back to being to aphid feeders here and has very square spots and um, often with these fusions, but that pronotum, so this species can look a little bit like um, the 10 spot as well. It doesn't so much here, but this pronotum marking, I kind of think it looks like a sort of fist um, shape, but actually I was giving this uh, a talk on identification to the Reading University students. And um, one of them said to me, it looks a little bit like Shrek. So I think maybe actually that is a better description than the one I've given in terms of that pronotum marking. It looks like Shrek's head. So at the top row here, we have a set of scale insect feeding um, ladybirds. And I, these are just beautiful, aren't they? They have this ridge around um, their bodies. No, none of them have any white markings at all, unlike the harlequin ladybird. But the harlequin ladybird can look quite like a kidney spot or the kidney spot can look like a harlequin ladybird. But the, the kidney spot does not have any white on the head at all. Heather ladybird is, I really love heather ladybirds. And they have this um, set of what looks like six spots going in a, a band across their body, but actually it's two spots, but with some indentations of the black um, coloration within it. But in terms of developing that color pattern, it comes out as two spots. And then there's a pine ladybird with this sort of comma-shaped red marking at, at the front. And again, some people get that one confused with the harlequin ladybird but just remember it doesn't have any of those white markings. Now we're back to some mildew feeding, a mildew feeding ladybird again. This is the orange ladybird. And this is another one you'll see on Saturday, I almost guarantee. And they're quite active still at this time of the year. And you might even see their larvae. We will see harlequin larvae probably as well. But because they're mildew feeding, their development is quite a bit slower. Um, so um, you'll often see them around at this time of year and they're a species of ladybird that actually keeps a little bit active all the way through the winter months. So, so this is a, a delight to see even in the midst of winter, commonly seen on deciduous trees, um, feeding on the mildew on the undersides of the, the leaves, but absolutely stunning um, ladybird.
it can look quite like the cream spot ladybird. But I often think, I just go back, I often think the spots, this isn't a very good description, the spots of the orange ladybird are quite kind of chaotically spaced and splodgy. And they just seem a little bit neater on the cream spot in these kind of rows of bands going along the body. But often the cream spots are a lot more of a chestnutty brown color, but they, they are quite um, tricky to, to tell apart. The, the orange ladybird has a sort of translucent ridge around the edge as well, which the, the cream spot doesn't have. So I just put this slide in to think about how to go about surveying ladybirds. And I've done all kinds of um, ladybird field trips with people with all kinds of ages, with brownies, um, all through to um, older groups. And um, often I find that it, you, just looking is enough, just using your eyes and scouting out around the, the looking up in the trees, which I do a lot, or um, scouring the, the nettles, for instance. But you can also use an upturned umbrella. I was out with some brownies um, a couple of weeks ago and I took them pillowcases, white pillowcases, so they could beat trees into some white pillowcases while they held either side. And we saw lots of orange ladybirds and harlequins um, doing that. And some of you may well have a sweep net and, and they, they are great for sweeping um, through the grasses. And, and you can do this in sort of structured ways as well, sort of set number of beating of the, the vegetation or set number of sweeping. More often than not, when I'm out about, I'm just doing it in a very casual way, just because I enjoy looking for ladybirds. There's lots of resources available. There's the wonderful Field Study Council charts um, that um, I think also make excellent birthday cards and Christmas cards. So um, they're, they're very good. Um, we have a website. Uh, we recommend iRecord for um, the recording of the ladybird um, sightings. And most recently we produced a field guide to the ladybirds of Britain and Ireland. Um, it was published back in 2019 and Richard Lewington has done the illustrations. And, and what's really unique about it is the first guide that brings together pictures of the inconspicuous ladybirds, which are these tiny ladybirds that I'll come to in a short while, alongside the, um, the bigger, more colorful ladybirds. And um, we're also quite active on Twitter as a ladybird community. And um, one of the many things that I love about um, running the recording scheme is interacting with the community of recorders. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Sometimes I do it through iRecord by putting a comment um, back to someone and then I hear back from them, people email. Um, but Twitter is a great source of um, discussion as well. And this was a particular sort of coldish Sunday uh, evening. And somebody, um, Per from Scotland, sent through this picture and said, could this be a hieroglyphic ladybird? And I thought, well, it could be, but it's quite difficult to tell from that picture. It could also perhaps be a two-spot ladybird. And where he said he'd seen it, I was thinking, yeah, for sure, that's going to be a two-spot ladybird, because I find it really hard to find hieroglyphic ladybirds in places that aren't um, out on heathlands, for example. And um, then I consulted with Richard Comont, who's one of my PhD students, but he's amazing um, in entomologist just very generally. He said he needs to see the prosternum, which is a, a plate underneath the, the body of the ladybird. And so Alper went into his garden, found the ladybird, took a picture of the prosternum, and we were able to confirm, indeed, it is a hieroglyphic ladybird found in his garden in Edinburgh. And there's been a few more sightings since. So that's just a nice way we sort of interact. And I think as well, it highlights it's really easy to make mistakes over recording and identifying um, insects generally. But as a consequence, we learn so much from one another. And I think that's what I really enjoy about the community as well, that we all learn from one another. And Per was very excited that he had found this hieroglyphic ladybird. And I was excited he had found it too. This is a group of school children who um, sent me a tweet to say they were doing a ladybird survey. So um, I joined in from my desk um, and my office desk every so often answering their questions while they were out and about doing their ladybird surveys. That was a lot of fun um, as well. And Quite recently, in the last, um, since 2018, I've been doing quite a lot of work on the UK overseas territories, and one of those is St Helena, which is pictured in the bottom corner here. And um, I was over there doing some work and then got stranded if the flight couldn't get back to collect um, me and the team. And then I was thinking, well, what I need to do is ask if I can come and visit some schools, talk about ladybirds, go and see if there's a brownie group. And um, I had a great week being stranded over on St. Helena, doing all kinds of engagement and chatting um, to the young people there about um, the various insects that they, they were seeing. So this is one of the little inconspicuous ladybirds. And I use it as an example 
I mean, it's my only first county record, shall I say, and it goes back to May 2013. And you can see I'm still living out on, on this, this first county record. I was collecting Harlequin ladybirds, actually, for Richard Comont during his PhD. And I found this little ladybird. And you can see these little inconspicuous ones. It's only a few millimeters long. It's very hairy, has this kind of triangular marking going down to the edge of the, the wing case. And it's called Skimnus interruptus. And all of these ladybirds, although they're tiny, they are relatively OK for identification and, and the field guide um, is helpful but there's also an amazing um, website that I'll send you the link to that has been um, produced by some amazing recorders. This is um, a water ladybird. This is one I struggle to find and then other people finding in huge numbers. So it's very sort of patchy distributed. And I think that's the other thing that can be with ladybirds. Sometimes people will think it's a really poor ladybird year because they're not seeing so many, but they can be very patchy in their, in their distribution. And this is a ladybird that cut, changes color um, so in the summer it has bright colors and in the winter it goes into more camouflage colors. Really amazing. This is a graph just so showing how the numbers of records over time and the scheme was established back in the early 1970s. And um, there's always received quite a lot of records. And for sure, Pete and I stand on the shoulders of, of giants of John Muggleton and um, Mike Majerus who led the scheme um, beforehand. But it does show how online recording and also promotion with the Harlequin Ladybird um, highlighting um, the importance of recording ladybirds, how we've had this increase in um, records. And we probably get about 20 to 30,000 records a year now, um, which is really um, amazing. And we can see that as well now, we're getting records pretty much all through um, the year. Um, people just sending in their sightings. Of course, there's a less around for the winter months, but nevertheless, people are finding them to see. And this just shows um, the records coming in um, over um, time. And with a sort of consistently high number of um, harlequin ladybirds, of course, it goes up and down a little bit. Um, and sometimes we get more for seven spot ladybirds than harlequin ladybirds, but they're both species of ladybird that we get quite a lot of um, records for. Um, and um, the number for the two spot ladybird um, declining. Um, over time. So we have been um, running um, some models to look at um, the status of ladybirds. And this is some work by um, Charlie Uthwaite from University College London. And it is a depressing picture, I'm afraid, as it is for so many um, insect groups, um, that there are many species that are showing um, declines. And with this daily bipunctatus, the two-spot ladybird being one of those species that um, is showing decline. Others um, that we barely um, have seen so much of, like Stathorus punctillum, also showing a decline. But I will say this last summer, we've had so many records of this little Stathorus punctillum. That's our smallest ladybird. It's about a millimeter long, has bright yellow legs. So if you do see it, even though it's tiny, it's quite easy to see it. So black and hairy with these bright yellow legs. Of course, we're seeing some increasing. We've seen the orange ladybird showing an increase in um, recent decades, which is, is, a, is fantastic. We're not really sure why, whether it's feeding on more mildews, we don't know. It used to be thought to be an ancient woodland indicator, but now it's found in so many different places. And then we have these new rhizobius arriving, Chrysomoloides and um, Lefante here as well. But now we also have Forestieri that's just arrived as well. And of course, the Harlequin ladybird has been um, on the increase. So this is um, the, the data that um, is in this paper from Charlie um, Uthwaite um, showing these estimates of trends over time. And we were able to use those trends to put into the field guide to show whether the ladybird was increasing, decreasing or stable within its distribution trends. So all that information is also now captured in the field guide. I thought I'd mention a few of the, the research papers, but I won't go into a lot of detail on these ones. These are papers that um, Richard Comont led so brilliantly, and he was looking at um, distribution patterns of ladybirds and whether they were affected by landscape or climate and how the, um, the harlequin ladybird might be affecting them as well. And um, he showed that there were a variety of different patterns, but definitely harlequin ladybirds um, increased the extinction rates of ladybirds within square. So this isn't a huge, this isn't like a global extinction. These are a small local extinctions um, when there is the co-occurrence and it's the likelihood of that extinction is increased. So 
thinking about the Harlequin ladybird in the context of um, invasive alien or invasive non-native species, I thought it would be a, a nice opportunity to mention this this report here that's just come out, and, and maybe you saw it within the in the news um, in recent months. So it was just one month ago that this was um, published, and I was one of the three people leading this team of 86 people who put together this this huge report, this huge synthesis over four years of information on invasive alien species around the world and I mention it as well because it, if it wasn't for the harlequin ladybird I, I I don't know that I would have gone into this area of work on non-native species and it's, it's it's as a community ecologist it's really fascinating to study um, invasive non-native or invasive alien species but it is also really concerning that they are indeed a major and growing threat to to nature and people but further information on that report is all available online. So I just thought I would give some context and, and tell you a little bit more about the research on the Harlequin ladybird. And I think it's really important to define what we mean by alien or non-native species and what we mean by invasive, non-native or alien species. So non-native species, and that's a term we use in the UK, the rest of the world pretty much we use alien species, but alien or non-native, a species that have been moved from one part of the world to another by humans to places where they wouldn't have otherwise occurred. And this is the briony ladybird found throughout Surrey and now actually our, the new map will show a few more dots as well. So, But it's a species that was first recorded in the mid 1990s. And as you can see from the map, it's not really gone very far at all. It feeds on white briony. It's quite a large ladybird. It's now around my neighborhood quite a bit, um, but a very, very beautiful ladybird, a pleasure to see. And we classify this one as an, a non-native species and not concerned about it. In contrast, this is the harlequin ladybird, and it is a non-native species. It's been moved from one part of the world to another as a biological control agent, and it's also hitchhiked with people on goods and um, in their luggage, etc. But we do classify it as being invasive because of its rapid spread and also the impacts it has on biodiversity ecosystems and the way that we live. And this map, the animation shows its spread over time. And all of these records are from volunteers. It's spread at about 80 to 100 kilometers per year. Um, as you can see, it's still very sparsely scattered in Scotland, but we are getting increasing number of records um, at the border, but an incredibly dramatic spread of this um, species that we would consider an invasive non-native species. So after it had arrived and um, we had this amazing data from um, the volunteer recorders. And if you picture the, the UK in lots of different grid squares, there were some squares where the Harlequin ladybird hadn't got and some squares where it had. And so we were able to look at the distribution trends with and without the Harlequin ladybird. And I won't go through this whole panel of graphs, but that top corner one is for a daily by punctata. The black line is the data from Britain. The red line is the data from Belgium. But what we can see for Britain was the two spot ladybirds are actually showing a distribution increase. But with the Harlequin ladybird, it's plummeted and had a 44% decline in its distribution over time. And that's the dashed line. Indeed, actually, seven out of eight of those species are all showing distribution declines. And it's only the seven spot ladybird, Coxnus to Puntata, that is remaining kind of stable um, with the Harlequin ladybird. The Harlequin ladybird outcompetes the other ladybirds, particularly the two spot ladybird that has high niche overlap with, but it also feeds on the other ladybirds. And um, two spots just aren't very well defended and the Harlequin ladybird can just consume them. What we're moving on to think about is what does this mean for the ecosystem function um, and resilience by this big shift in the community assemblage of ladybirds. So this is a bit of a, a, a chaotic graph perhaps it's looking, but this is just to show our very, very recent analysis. We decided to repeat that um, analysis kind of 10 years on. And this is the data for um, including the Netherlands in the pink, Britain in the blue and Belgium in the green and showing the trends for a daily by punctata with a solid line and harmonia axiridis for the dashed line. And you can see that harmonia increased massively in all countries and has kind of had quite a sort of stable um, trend. Whereas in all countries, two spot ladybirds declined um, rapidly um, following um, the arrival of the harlequin ladybird. 
Now, this is quite a busy graph. The next one's even busier. So I won't spend too much time on this one, but this is basically showing for a set of different ladybirds. And this is the data just for the UK now. And we're about to publish this. We're just writing it up at the moment. But it builds on those trends analysis and shows that still two spot ladybirds are in decline. That's what the red little dots mean going down for the top um, left hand corner. But you can see for some of the others, there might be sort of tantalizing evidence of some sort of um, recovery beginning um, to happen. And for sure, ladybird populations fluctuate up and down a lot. Um, but there's no doubt the harlequin had quite an impact, um, certainly on first arrival. And for some of the species, it's continuing um, to cause difficulties. One of the things that we're also interested in is um, the harlequin ladybird within the context of these sort of ecological networks, the way it interacts with all these species and what that might mean in terms of the resilience of that system. So if we think about whether pest control is going to be as good with the harlequin ladybird dominating these community assemblages or, or not. And our predictions would be not in that many of the ladybirds have very subtle life history differences that mean that when you have a collection of them, they all have slightly different roles. You know, they like to feed in slightly different parts of the plant or slightly different parts of the year or indeed on different plants. And so all of these things kind of make this complex pattern um, that the harlequin ladybird for sure is disrupting. And recently, uh, one of my PhD students, though, so this is some perhaps some brighter news, um, Rachel Farrow has been um, working on five spot ladybirds because we were quite concerned that this little ladybird, which is really rare in the UK, and it's restricted to um, river shingle on fast flowing rivers. And we were just concerned that if the harlequin ladybird was able to thrive in those habitats, what would that mean for the five spot ladybird? I won't go through all of the um, data in a lot of detail, but you can see the red bars for the five spots um, are higher than the harlequin. So the harlequin isn't going into those sites too much. And actually the five spot ladybird seems to be um, thriving in its unstable habitat. A lovely ladybird to see. I highly recommend a visit um, to, to Wales, for example, to go and see it. I thought I'd also just mention some of the uh, international collaborations that we've been really fortunate to have. And um, Pete and I work with ladybird recorders from all around the world and people who are running schemes. And this is um, Audrey and Tanya in Chile. And, and we joined them on one of their projects um, to hear about the work they've been doing on um, ladybirds. And one of the things we did, we decided probably slightly frivolously, but it was a lovely day out to go and see how high we could record harlequin ladybirds within the Andes. And we got this record at 3,578 meters above sea level in this kind of very barren environment, but still it was able to find things to live on and really demonstrates why this particular non-native species is so successful. Um, it can just um, cope with very, very many different um, environmental conditions. And much more recently, I've been working with Victoria um, Verenkraut, and she came to the UK for six months on, an, uh, on a fellowship and um, set up a ladybird survey for Argentina. And she's just been inspirational in engaging people in Argentina um, with a whole variety of resources to increase the records available um, on Harlequin ladybirds, but also on other ladybirds as well. Just really inspiring work. And as you be seeing, and I mentioned, we received so many records, and we have been thinking about whether or not um, computer vision, AI can help us with the verification. And I know that for Pete and I, we both love doing the verification ourselves. But if, for example, I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking, well, there is a bit of a lag in verifying your ladybird records, and maybe AI could help us to speed it up, for example, for the seven spot ladybird. And it's looking good, um, but it's not quite there yet, but for sure, the future is bright for using computer vision for helping us with verification. And actually, another thing we've been thinking about is ways in which we can use new technologies for inset recording and monitoring as well. And again, acoustic monitoring, um, computer vision, there are many different ways in which technologies going on for smartphone apps, etc., are going to um, also contribute to insect ecology and monitoring. So just to, to, to give a quick summary, biological records are so valuable for assessing patterns and trends in the distribution of many species. And actually, not only that, we get so many um, life history um, 
stories from biological recorders that really contribute to our very deep understanding of the ecology of these ladybirds and particularly these little teeny tiny ladybirds there's there's so much we don't know about them there's so many questions that could be um, addressed about them and and that's what we can all do together ladybird distribution patterns are dynamic there are lots and ups and downs and we are showing that there are many species that are having long-term declines but there are some that are showing stable patterns and indeed a few that are also increasing in their their distribution there will be opportunities to use new technologies but you know i think it will remain a pleasure for many of us to go out either with our smartphone app or our notebook and a pen and paper and just keep recording but those smartphone apps are going to get cleverer at helping to point out to us what the identification might be while we're out in the field or or linking us to the wider community in many different ways so i think it's really exciting to consider the range of approaches um, that that we can use but most of all, what I would say is just the joy of celebrating biodiversity together is what biological recording brings for me. Just being part of the community with all of you and just celebrating biodiversity. And whether it be in the, the churchyard that you visit at the weekend or whether it be in the Andes in um, Chile, it's just so wonderful to be out recording and sharing that experience with others. So thank you very much to the London Natural History Society. And then thank you to, to many who have provided um, funding um, for me and um, the Biological Record Centre for hosting the UK Ladybird Survey. Thank you so much, Helen. That was really fantastic. I thought you kind of packed such a lot into it and it's made me think, particularly in terms of the ID, I'm really glad we're recording that it will be really useful to go back um, and to look again and all the little sort of tips that you were giving in terms of ID and I was kind of doing the same thing the pronotum <laughs> thing so it's obviously kind of pretty stern. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah it's great actually it's you know it's kind of slightly it's, it's probably slightly strange but it does help <laughs> you to remember so that that was really and it was also really interesting to see some of the very recent data so thank you for sharing that with us that's I mean obviously pleasure. that's sort of hot off the press or, or going to the press yeah. um, but interesting that kind of some of the long-term trends may be different, you know, particularly with the Harlequin, uh, impact of the Harlequin ladybird, the long-term trends may not be quite the same as what seemed to be the kind of immediate response. So that's, and hopefully it kind of won't be quite as dire as it sort of did seem to be at, at, at some point. Um, I've got a few questions as well in my head, but I think we should start with the audience questions because the chat's been quite busy. So Anchor, over to you first and I'll see if I can squeeze a couple of mine in at the end. Yeah, I've got one as well, so <laughs> we'll be duking it out. Um, well, actually, there were quite a few questions, um, comments about harlequins, of course. Um, and I think you kind of answered a lot, but I think I might just ask them anyway, just to kind of, you know, reaffirm what you, you were saying. So Rory was saying, are harlequins as bad as people say and are invasive species that need exterminating? And Guy Guy... Um, was asking what is being done to manage the Harlequin invasion? Yeah, great question. So nothing is being done to manage the Harlequin invasion because there is nothing that we can do. Once it arrived, we did a very, very rapid review of potential um, possibilities for managing it. And there's nothing that can be done that wouldn't affect other ladybirds, for instance. And also that would actually be effective because it's a species that just has such a high reproductive rate. It would just keep bouncing back. And so we really ask people not even to kill them themselves because it would make no difference to the population and they're so easily confused with other species. But of course, recording them is really valuable. And I will say that by having that first online recording and tracking the spread of the Harlequin ladybird, it did give people like DEFRA, for instance, the confidence in that online recording and engaging people in recording invasive non-native species. And you may be aware that there's been a bit of an upturn in Asian Hornet records over this last year. And that system follows exactly the same system that we developed for the Harlequin ladybird and that we were then able to use for the Asian hornet. And we run that system within the Biological Record Center and it has been really busy. And of course that is a particular insect where something can be done because all the hornets go back to the nest at night and then the nest can be removed. So there are examples where there can be effective management 
um, of invasive um, non-native species. But really the best approach is to prevent their arrival in the first place, to mm. try and use effective biosecurity to really minimize um, those species that could be coming in and causing problems. But then I think it's also really important to remember that many non-native species do not cause problems. And, and that's why I highlight with the bryony ladybird as well. Um, well, kind of related, um, I think this question was asked just prior um, to you kind of explaining what was happening, but um, CMM Mill um, was asking why the two spot is declining in particular. Yep. And Victoria was kind of expanding on that and saying um, with the two spot, is it competition for aphids um, leading to its decline as well as predation? And yeah, you're absolutely right, Victoria, that it is competition as well. And unfortunately for the two spot ladybird, it has a high overlap in where it lives with the harlequin ladybird. Two spot ladybirds love being in deciduous trees. The harlequin ladybird loves being in deciduous trees. One of the other misfortunes for the two spot ladybird is that its life cycle is slightly slower than than slightly ahead rather of the harlequin ladybird. So when it's at a pupil stage, the harlequin is often in a fourth instar stage, which is a really hungry larval stage. And there's the pupae just sitting there and the harlequin larvae just feed on them. So they have this high niche overlap. The two spot ladybird is not well chemically defended. We wonder in fact, whether it's this color pattern variable because it's mimicking other ladybirds that are more um, distasteful, but that would be more for vertebrate predators attacking it. The harlequin ladybird just feeds on the two spot ladybirds and also is a more um, efficient aphid feeder. So yeah, also is out competing the two spot. So you mentioned color variation and there are a couple of questions about that. So Becky was wondering um, how the color variations were determined to be the same species and not just hybrids. Was this through DNA testing? And Mario was wondering if the particular variation of one species, does that get transmitted to its offspring? Yeah, really <laughs> both brilliant questions. Um, in terms of knowing that they're the same species, they, they mate and they produce viable offspring. Um, so that would have been how people looked at it before we had molecular tools to be able to do sort of DNA barcoding and know that therefore they are the same species, which indeed we can also um, now do. But it is really fascinating that they are so color, color pattern variable. Um, in terms of the second question, uh, that is more tricky because they do, yes, so sure, there are complex genetics behind these color patterns. And um, there are some amazing studies, including by Mike Majerus, where he looked at the kind of dominant genes leading to different kind of color pattern permutations. But for example, there have been in the UK, we just have three color patterns for the harlequin ladybird, predominantly. We occasionally get a fourth, the axorillus form, but we that's it. But there have been about 100 recorded worldwide, and the, the genetics behind that is phenomenally um, complex. But it is, in, yeah, these things are, they are inherited. Oh, but I should also say, though, there is also, there was a wonderful study where it showed that um, there are environmental factors as well. So this time of year, when you're seeing harlequin ladybirds that have appeared from their pupae, they have bigger spots, the, the um, orange one with the black spots, than they do from the spring generation. And it seems that if a harlequin ladybird is a pupa when it's cold, it comes out with bigger spots. So when you're out and about on Saturday and Sunday, have a look and see if there's a lot of harlequin ladybirds with really big splodgy spots. And then in the spring, you'll start to see those ones that just have the more pimpering and sometimes no spots at all, which I think is amazing. I'll have to go back and look at some of the photographs. Yeah, I've taken yeah it's um, making me think that as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, there was also, you know, still kind of staying with the whole color change. Um, Sylvia was wondering if the water ladybird is the only one which changes color throughout the year. It is. It is indeed. And yeah, it makes it extra special for that, doesn't it? But um, yeah, it is the only one known to do that. It's, it's amazing. Oh, well, I say that. I mean, some of the others will, their color matures. So often when a seven spot ladybird emerges from its pupa, it's quite a sort of orangey color and slowly more of the pigments get laid down and it becomes a richer red. But it's that, that's just sort of uh, pigments um, being maturing over time. Whereas with the, the water ladybird, it's really quite a contrasting going from the sort of pinkish color to a beige color. Can I just pop in and ask if, what the sort of 
reason we think that happens? What is, you know, is it, what's that adaptation for? Well, it seems to be that in the winter coloration, it's camouflaging within the reeds that it occurs in. Um, and then in it's using bright warning colors when it's active in the summer months. But, you know, others don't do that. But then many of the others are tucking, you know, themselves away more into the, for example, two spot ladies will go, lady bears will go behind bark or they come into the window frames as well, the harlequin lady bears, the seven spots are going underneath the leaf litter. I mean, the, the little water lady bears do tuck themselves into the reeds, but maybe they are, evolution has driven them to be, um, to need to be more camouflaged at that point, um, rather than all the others remaining very brightly coloured. Um, so still with the harlequins, they're so popular or not. Um, William was asking, where do harlequin ladybirds come from and how did they, or do they affect the ecosystems there? Yes, so they come from quite a broad area across Asia. So you can find them in China as a native species. And actually, Pete and I had the, um, we enjoyed going to China together um, for a meeting. And we took some time to go out and see harlequin ladybirds at home. But yeah, harlequin ladybirds at home also do cause problems. They also overwinter in very large numbers and can be a human nuisance um, in doing so. They are kind of the top predator of that assemblage of ladybirds. So they are the most abundant um, over in their native range as well. Um, but of course, them, you know, they've had a long time living there and being with the other ladybirds as well. And they do have a whole variety of paras parasitoids and parasites within their native range, which is difficult to know whether they control the populations much at all. But for sure, our surveys in the UK show that still at the moment they're escaping parasitism. I have a um, wonderful person um, working with me at the moment, Robin, and they have been doing parasite surveys more recently and are really showing that there's a much lower prevalence of parasitism within harlequins um, than there are for native ladybirds. You mentioned um, when you were in China that the, one of the problems is the, the harlequin ladybirds um, hibernating in human habitation. And we've obviously got that problem here. Um, and Alison was wondering, I mean, I'm assuming it's harlequins. I think um, seven spots might do it a little bit too, but I have a huddle of ladybirds hibernating in my bedroom on the window frame. What should I do? <laughs> so, I mean, I also have the same. I get hundreds in, in the bedroom windows. And um, I mean, I just leave them where they are. I know that for some people that's not ideal. And, and I have had it before where then I've had, for example, guests staying and then they open the window and they get this sort of deluge of harlequin ladybirds. And I've forgotten to warn them that there are a lot in their window frame. And apparently that's not always pleasant for everybody so sometimes people may want to remove them and then we just suggest that you just very gently brush them into a into some kind of box and then put them put them back outside and to, it's important to gently do that because they will ladybirds exude this yellow substance which is their defensive secretions and that can stain if they're near curtains or on the wall it can stain um, the furnishings so just to do it very gently so you don't alarm them too much and of course record them <laughs> <laughs> um that actually kind of relates to a question that andrew just um, put into the comments are ladybirds toxic to other animals um for example are there color colors warning colors or are they just faking it yeah that's a really excellent question so they taste, they more taste horrible than, than are actually toxic. So, um, I mean, if you are recording ladybirds a lot in the field, you can't help but sometimes taste it on your hands. And, and it is a very bitter taste, the sort of um, their defensive secretions. Um, and really it's more for, for example, birds feeding on the wing that might consume um, a ladybird will spit them out because they exude this horrible tasting substance and and so they're not really faking it they genuinely are sort of warning colors but a bird would have to eat quite a lot of them for it to cause them um, too much of a problem and some of them are less toxic than others or less distasteful than others so as i mentioned the um the Adelia bipunctata, the two-spot ladybird the chemical is often named after genus as so adeline is their their toxic chemical and that's quite benign whereas the harlequin ladybird is really quite unpleasant and um it does put it you know they, there is uh 
the way we've sort of put ladybirds into dishes together to see whether one will eat the other. And harlequin ladybirds don't tend to get eaten by many other things. They do seem to, their sort of warning secretions and their distastefulness does seem to be off-putting. So kind of veering a little bit to different topics, um, two questions which I'm going to kind of put together. Um, first of all, are any ladybird species legally protected in the UK? And what else can we do in our gardens besides leaving um, leaf litter um, to kind of encourage uh, ladybirds into them? Yes, so as far as the ladybirds are concerned, we have status reviews, so we know where they are within those issues, but they, their protection would be through, for example, habitat protection, where they might be occurring, rather than protection um, for them legally. Um, they don't, there's not sort of a specific um, legislation around ladybirds, for example, but they would come under other legislation that's generally protecting our environment and our habitats. In terms of what people can do to encourage ladybirds, um, so certainly when in the, the summer months, leaving um, some aphids and pest insects on runner beans or sweet peas or roses or whatever is really beneficial. Early in the year, they, like many other insects, will feed on pollen and nectar a little bit to get their energy supplies going at the start of spring. So having some early spring flowers is great. They love hawthorn, for instance, in the early spring. And then, yes, leaving leaf litter and having sort of some untidy patches is, is very good for ladybirds as well. So many of these things that people might do for other insects are also very beneficial um, for ladybirds. Just having perhaps a slightly untidy garden in places at, at the least, reducing the, the use of chemicals um, and allowing some of the pest insects to be there as well. And I often think aphids are really amazing as well. So it's kind of nice to just have them there. That is such, I think that's a really nice point. We're going to have to sort of finish off um, because it is eight o'clock and I, I kind of don't want to keep kind of keep you longer. But uh, it's also that's a nice thing to finish off, nice note to finish on, I think, about, you know, what we can do um, to, you know, also recording aphids, but also kind of helping them and keeping them kind of going as much as we can, particularly in the sort of, obviously, some it's about bigger habitats as well, but even in the habitats that we've got some sort of control over. Um, that's those are really useful tips. Thank you. We've got lots of really nice positive comments coming through the chat about how much people have enjoyed the session, and I'm sure people will enjoy the you know who did manage to make it will enjoy the recording as well. I just want to say thank you so much again for agreeing to speak to us and your enthusiasm for Ladybirds just really kind of comes through. It's it's lovely to listen to you and to sort of see all the kind of community interaction that you're involved with here and internationally, I think that's so important that we kind of get that shit sense of shared community and appreciate the natural world. So thank you so much. And, you know, um, maybe we'll be able to invite you back some other time to find out a bit more about, you know, where things go next. Yeah, um, thank you. Like yeah. It. So thank you so much for, for speaking with us and um, hopefully, you know, stay in touch and we'll yeah. maybe speak again soon. Thank you. Oh, thank you all. It's been an absolute pleasure to be with you all. So thank you very much. And thanks for your Ladybird records. And I look forward to more coming through. Um, if people want to unmute themselves and say goodbye, you, you're most welcome to in a second. Just to let you know, we're about to enter into the LNHS, our AGM season, which means there'll be online talks nearly every week in November. So that's very exciting. Take a look at Eventbrite on our website if you want to find out details. There's usually a little sort of business section, but then there's an online talk to follow. And the first one of those will be on the 9th of November, where Mick Massey will be talking about, he'll be comparing Hampstead Heath and Hounslow Heath. The tale of two heaths. So that should be fascinating. Please do sign up if you're interested in coming along. We hope to see you all again very soon.